Today, again, we're going to be covering the first part of chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10. In that first part of that chapter, the author will bring his entire discussion on the superiority of Jesus' priestly ministry to a marvelous conclusion. Now, if you remember the past few weeks, or while we've been studying this book so far, chapter by chapter, he had argued in chapters 1 and 2 that even though the Son was in a position lower than the angels when he came to earth, in fact, he is superior, far superior than all the angels. Now, the reason he came here and made himself lower than the angels, he did that in order to identify with us human beings and to suffer on our behalf. Then in chapters 5 and 7, he pointed out, the writer pointed out that by virtue of his identity with humanity and his suffering, the son was appointed by God as high priest a position that made him superior to the Levitical priests of the Old Covenant. The author then went on to say in chapter 8 that as a superior priest, Jesus also presents to God a superior offering, one that relates to a better covenant. This offering was done in the heavenly realm, involved the deaths of Christ rather than animals, and as chapter 9 showed us last week, it's been made once for all. And so it's at this point, it's actually it's this point, the fact that it's been made once and for all, the writer now will focus and elaborate in the first 18 verses of chapter 10. That passage there will remind us that since man sinned in the garden, sin is man's greatest problem. And no matter what kind of religion a person has, if it doesn't directly deal with the problem of sin, it really is of no value. See, when it comes down to it, you and I, every single person here on earth that's alive, are by nature sinful. And this fact is proven when we deliberately choose to sin. And as someone once famously put it, and I'm sure you've heard of this before, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. When it comes to the problem of sin, our verse today will show you that in spite of its intended purposes, or intended purpose, the old covenant sacrifices were unable to completely atone for sins for sin. But Jesus' sacrifice puts aside those old covenant practices and secures total forgiveness and sanctification for God's people. For that reason, again, I titled this message, One Sacrifice for All Time. Before we get into our passage today, let's pray. Oh God, we are humbled and thank you that you brought us here. That you care for us and you love us. And you called us your children. We thank you for sending your son to die for us and give us hope. And I pray that you would bless this time. We will bless the service that we're about to have here. Speak powerfully now to those that are here, those that are watching and listening. 
speak directly into their hearts and minds. Their lives will be changed for all eternity. Because now to get into your word, pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. The Word of God says, Since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the reality itself of, of those things, it can never affect the worshipers by the same sacrifice they continually offer year after year. Otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered? Since the worshippers, purified once and for all, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in the sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year after year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, as he was coming into the world, he said, You did not desire sacrifice and offering, but you prepared a body for me. You did not delight in whole burnt offerings and sin offerings. Then I said, see, it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. After he says above, you did not desire delight in sacrifices and offerings, whole burnt offerings and sin offerings, which are offered according to the law. He then says, see, I will have I have come to you to do your will. He takes away the first to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified to the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of Sherlock Holmes' detective novels, was a practical joker. One time he sent a telegram to 12 famous people in London whom he knew. It read, Flee at once, all is discovered. Although all 12 were upright citizens, they all quickly left the country. This story may be fictitious, but it illustrates the fact that a guilty conscience is a common thing. Even in the church, Many, uns many are uncertain of understanding before God because of past sins. These ghosts, these skeletons in the closet from the past stay out of sight for a while. But then they come out, out of nowhere, and begin to haunt them. They wonder if anyone else knows what they've done. They're fe fearful that the truth may leak out. But even more seriously, they wonder if God has truly forgiven them. They're not sure how it will go when they stand before him one day. Will God punish them in this life or in eternity for the terrible thing that they've done? Such people need assurance that our text hammers home. Through Christ's obedience to God's will on the cross, new covenant believers receive what those under the law could not receive, complete and total forgiveness. So in the, so these verses, in these verses, uh, they pinpoint some of the key deficiencies of the old covenant sacrifices. As the author makes clear in those verses, in these verses we just read, old covenant sacrifices were merely shadows of better things to come. They were offered year after year, but could never save and could never perfect those that were drawing near to God, those that were trying to draw near to God. In verse 1, the author uses descriptive language to demonstrate that the law pointed to the good things to come. That phrase, good things to come, sums up everything Christ purchased and accomplished for us 
by virtue is life, death, and resurrection. The greatest of these good things is the forgiveness of sins. A point that he already made and that the writer already made clear in chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. This eternal redemption that was accomplished by Christ is the key contrast between the Old and the New Covenant. While the New Covenant brings permanent redemption through Christ, the Old Covenant only temporarily suspended the judgment of God. This is something that Paul also mentions in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. Now, also, for instance, on the night when the angel of death struck the firstborn of Egypt, the firstborn sons of Israel were saved because the Israelites acted in faith and with the blood of the Passover lamb across the doorposts as God had commanded. While Israel's firstborns would eventually die because of their sin, they didn't expire. They didn't die on that horrible day of God's judgment against the Egyptians. Why? Because God delayed his justice and judgment on account of his sacrifice. Thus, God received every sacrifice that preceded Christ's sacrifice as a means of suspending his wrath against sin. Also, you also see in verse 1, the author of Hebrews uses the image of a shadow to draw the contrast between Christ's sacrifice and the old covenant sacrifices. When Christ died on the cross, he didn't shed the blood of another. He shed his own blood. Nor did he enter a tabernacle by making a sacrifice for his own sin first. Our Lord and Savior Jesus was sinless. Nor did he enter the man-made tabernacle. He entered the heavenly tabernacle. Then, after he accomplished atonement for us, he accomplished an eternal redemption once for all time. Which brings, my friends, true true forgiveness of sins. All those animals died as shadows pointing to the realities accomplished through the cross of Christ. And there on the cross at Calvary, Christ perfectly, perfectly fulfilled all these things. Another contrast in verse 1 is when Yahweh uses the word law which refers to the totality of the Old Covenant. The law, that is the Old Covenant, has only a shadow of the good things to come. Under the Old Covenant, Israel merely saw the shape of what was to come. The shadow left them crying out for the real thing. You see, as a shadow, The Old Covenant is insufficient. They couldn't perfect those who drew near. Only Jesus can accomplish that. God is satisfied with the sacrifice of Christ and imputes the righteousness of His Son to us. Only by the blood of Jesus be able to enter into his kingdom into, and have eternal life. Nothing else. Nothing else at all. Now, in verse 2, the author asks a rhetorical question to draw, draw out the insufficiency of the old covenant sacrifices. Nothing could cleanse the consciousness of the people for the sin they, they commit right after the sacrifice. Thus, the law could do nothing. The law could do nothing to alleviate the guilt of the human conscience. The logic of verse 2 
is that the old covenant sacrifices had sufficiently delivered all the promises of God, the priests would have stopped offering them. But they didn't. They didn't stop offering them. In fact, they became a daily, weekly, and yearly occurrence. I'm sure there were times when it seemed like Israel's sacrifices just couldn't keep up with the people's sinfulness. Verse 3 reveals that these reoccurring sacrifices served as reminders of sin. They annually reminded the people of their guilt and disobedience and that the sacrifices couldn't ultimately purify them. See, year after year, year after year, the Day of Atonement reminded the people of their inability perfect to perfectly obey the commands of the law and desperately needed a priest to mediate on their behalf. Right, he continues making it this point. In verse 4, he also establishes an essential gospel point there in verse 4. It's impossible for the blood of animals to wash away sins. This claim is interesting, especially when we consider that the author says there is no forgiveness for sin without shedding of blood. Back in chapter 9, verse 22. Nevertheless, the old covenant sacrifices in all their bloodiness, in their goriness, couldn't take away sin. Instead, they pointed to the one sacrifice that could bring forgiveness of sin. Jesus Christ, his perfect sacrifice happened once and never, ever, ever needs to be repeated. His blood, unlike the blood of animals, washes away sins forever. Imagine for a minute that you're making your way. You're there in that living in that time period, and you're making your way to the tabernacle, bringing your little lamb with you, watching the blood flow as it is offered as a sacrifice. You're reminded once again that you're still a sinner. Still a sinner year after year after year. When Jesus came on the scene, however, what did he say? Do this in remembrance of me. In other words, he didn't say, remember your sin. He said, remember your Savior. The same, my friends, is still true today. To be honest with you, I have a tendency to keep returning to my own little sacrificial system, asking myself, how long did I pray today? Did I even pray today? Or how many chapters have I read this year? Have I read my Bible this year? But due to our inability to keep our own rules, rituals, and regulations, our promises and pledges only continually remind us or failures. That's why Jesus said, I don't want you to remember your sin by continual sacrifice. I want you to remember your salvation by continual celebration. The price has been paid. The blood has been shed. The work is done. Jesus left us with communion, not so we can say, Oh, we're such sinners, but that we would say, Oh, what a savior. It does in First Corinthians chapter eleven, that chapter that I read to you every time we have we have communion, say that if we drink 
unworthily were eating to our damnation? You may be asking. Yes. But what is meant here is that if you don't give worth to the work that was done, you're going to keep damning yourself. If, however, you say, I remember again, Lord, that you paid the price completely, then communion becomes what it's meant to be, a celebration of the finished work of the cross of Calvary. Now in verses 5 through 10, the author continues to draw out the distinction between Christ's sacrifice and the Old Testament sacrifices. He continues to highlight the inadequacy of the sacrifices made by the priests under the Old Covenant when compared to the superiority of the sacrifice made by our High Priest, Jesus Christ. Here the author particularly explains what Christ came into the world to accomplish and shows the necessity of his death and leans heavily in Psalm chapter 40. There the writer of Hebrews attributes Psalm chapter 40 verses 6 through 8 to Christ and his incarnation. He says, Christ spoke those words. This really shouldn't surprise us since the author believes that the triune God is the author of Scripture. But by asserting this, the writer demonstrates to his readers how to see Jesus in the Old Testament correctly. The author shows us that he didn't believe the psalm should only be read historically, but that it should be read typologically. Jesus came into the world to do his Father's will. This required laying down his life as a sacrifice for sins. This, it, it, this is what verses 5 through 7 teaches. When Christ entered the world, he knew that his body would be the sacrifice that pleased God and satisfied satisfy his wrath. Old covenant sacrifices and offerings couldn't ultimately bring the forgiveness of sins. Even worse, for many who made the offerings and sacrifices represented nothing more than a religious ritual. Those people were no longer offering up sacrifices in faith and obedience. They were just going through the motions. So that's something to think about as you come here every Sunday or wherever you go to, go to church on Sundays, wherever you're at, are you just going through the motions? Have you stopped really offering your spiritual sacrifices? And you stopped obeying. The father didn't ask his son to offer sacrifices. But God prepared a body for our Lord and asked him to be the sacrifice. In doing so, the father was asking the son for obedience. The father's will and the son's obedience were precisely what we see described in Isaiah chapter 53. Church, my brothers and sisters in Christ, God delights in obedience, not in burnt offerings and sin offerings. This doesn't mean that the old covenant offerings contradicted the will of God in any kind of way. It simply means God is not interested in religious ritual if it's not driven by faith and obedience. Works without faith are meaningless in God's eyes. In verse 8, the author of Hebrews then gives a brief commentary on the words he attributes to Jesus. 
There he further explains that God didn't delight in the offer, in the sacrifices of the Levitical cult offered according to the law. Once again, this highlights the temporary and inadequate nature of the Old Testament sacrifices. A greater sacrifice was still to come. A sacrifice in which God would be permanently pleased. Verse 9 then tells us that Jesus did away with the Old Covenant order to establish the new. This is what Jesus was announcing when he, when he said, See, I have come to do your will. Those words, those words of Jesus took away the first and established the second. Therefore, the Old Testament sacrificial system is completed. It's done. The author actually uses the Greek word for abolish to punctuate the termination of the Old Testament sacrificial system as forcefully as he can. The era of the law is over. Jesus abolished it. He is why we no longer need to sacrifice bulls and goats. Can you imagine if still had to, if you had to take a bull and goat and had to sacrifice it? Uh, I think I'd, I'd still need to do it. This good news for bulls and goats, but it's far better news for us. Verse 10 expands on the supremacy of the second and final sacrifice. In doing so, the author returns to the language of Jesus' body. Jesus did the will of the Father by offering his body as a once for all time substitute for sin. His willing sacrifice is the final and fully effective one that abolishes the old sacrifices and inaugurates the new covenant by virtue of their union with Christ and on account of his sacrifice we believers you as believers are now in the realm of the holy and purified you have been sanctified you are being sanctified once for all time is one of the most important phrases in Hebrews. It announces loud and clear that Christ's sacrifice is definitive and sufficient. No sacrifice ever needs to be made again. God is completely and absolutely pleased with his son's sacrifice. Also here, there in that verse, verse 10, the author is speaking emphatically. Not just once, but once for all time. So now I want to move on to the second half of our passage this morning. I'll be just covering all the way, to, reading all the way to verse 18. So the Bible's open. Follow along as I pick up in verse whatever. Every priest stands day after day, ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time, which can never take away sins. Stand after offering one sacrifice or sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. He is now waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever. Let me repeat that verse, verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. 
For after he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, the Lord says, I will put my laws in their hearts and write them on their minds, and I will never again remember their sins and their lawless acts. Now where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. So far, what we've seen in this chapter is a writer has been really doing an excellent job contrasting the Old and New Covenants. He's been doing this pretty much throughout the entire book. At the heart of these distinctions are two kinds of priests. Priests who stand and priests who sit. Verse 11 details the inadequacy of priests who stand. Under the Old Covenant, priests stood daily at God's service, offering the same sacrifice repeatedly. Again, verse 4 tells us that the sacrifice could never take away sins, yet they continued to offer them. They stood every day because their work was never completed, nor did they work progress. This is why the priest stood each day offering the same sacrifices over and over again. Their ministry had to be repeated generation by generation and could not save a single sinner. Verse 10, verse 12 then details the priests. The priest, singular, the priest who sits. Who is that priest? It's Jesus Christ. Once he offered a single sacrifice for sins, that was sufficient for all time. He sat down and now he's sitting at the right hand of God. This means that Jesus is seated in authority and power at the right hand of the Father and carries out the ministry of intercession for God's people there, waiting for the day his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. The priests who stand offer many sacrifices repeatedly. Jesus, however, only offers one sacrifice. He is sufficient to take away sins forever, and its benefits never end. Jesus sits because there is no need for him to keep standing. His atoning work is complete, and now He's up there with the Father, interceding for you and for me. Now, the anticipation of the time when Jesus' enemies are made a footstool brings us back to the words of Psalm 110. And there the psalmist tells us that the Messiah will make his enemies a footstool. This is a reference again to Jesus' second coming. The author of Hebrews has already alluded to the second coming back again in our previous chapter in, in verse 28. Chapter 9, verse 28. So this shows us the return of Christ is at the forefront of the author's mind. Jesus will return. But he will not uh, he will not come to offer another sacrifice. The priest who sits will, will return to judge his enemies. Jesus is the priest who sits in power. Verse 14 reiterates the effectiveness of Jesus' single offering. By the priestly offering of his own body, Jesus has perfected, not just improved, those who are being sanctified. So it makes you wonder, how many times and in how many ways can the author make this point? Evidently, one time isn't enough. 
we need to see this beautiful reality emphasized repeatedly. Jesus has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Let me make it a little bit more personal if you're a believer. Jesus has perfected for all time, for all of eternity, you who are being sanctified. His work perfects believers forever. Their perfection is an objective and end time reality that will never end. The author makes another appeal to the Old Testament in verses 15 through 18. And here he returns to Jeremiah chapter 31 and the revelation of the new covenant. The Lord promises to put the laws in the hearts of his people and to write them in, on their minds. Jesus' final and supreme sacrifice brings full forgiveness of sins. So an offering for sin is no longer necessary. The new covenant brings a new heart. The author once again attributes the words of the Old Testament to the Holy Spirit. Now, we've already seen him say that the Holy Spirit speaks through the Old Testament in chapter 3, verse 7, and chapter 9, verse 8. The new covenant was new, but it was not a new revelation. Jesus' sacrifice was the fulfillment. It was a fulfillment of the old revelation, the one promised by the prophet Jeremiah through the witness of the, old, of the Holy Spirit. Notice, the promise was not Jeremiah's. It was God's. Through Jeremiah's prophetic word, the Holy Spirit bears witness to this new covenant. So, so back in chapter 8, verses 8 through 12, the author references Jeremiah 31. Well, here he cites these verses again to tell his readers, to tell us this new covenant has been made with them, which suggests the author, right at this particular, actually at this particular moment when he's writing this to the to his original hearers, maybe conceiving, maybe thinking of his readers as the new Israel. Uh, whatever the case, the writer is expressing that the readers of this letter are also the recipients of the new covenant. One of the key features of this new covenant is God's sovereign grace. God himself writes his laws on the hearts and minds of his people. Their obedience is a result of his sovereign and gracious inscription. The old sacrifices could never accomplish this. Only Christ could. The words, I will never again remember their sins and their lawless acts, was it the reality in the Old Covenant? The people of Israel cried out in the knowledge of their sin, especially on the Day of Atonement. God still remembered their sin, even though he didn't pour his wrath on it immediately. But now that Christ has mediated a new and far better covenant, God no longer remembers our sins and our lawless deeds. He no longer remembers that horrible, terrible sin that you've kept secret from everyone. can keep it from God. He knows all about it. He's seen it. He's there. Guess what? As a believer, as a born-again believer, covered by the blood of Jesus, 
He no longer remembers that sin. He no longer remembers those sins or your lawless deeds. The blood of Jesus blots them out forever. In the final verse there, verse 18 that we read, the writer gives another important component of the forgiveness won by Jesus in the New Covenant. If Christ's blood, blood has truly granted forgiveness of sins forever, there is no longer an offering for sin. This is why there is a table for the Lord's Supper and not an altar for sacrificing animals in front of many churches. Christ accomplished everything necessary for the forgiveness of your sins. Because Jesus' Jesus offering for sin was sufficient to forgive you of your sins once for all time, His offering was sufficient to end all other offerings. This here, this last verse, let me mention mention this. If the Roman Catholic Church and Orthodox churches would accept the message here of our text, not just here, but what we read so far, it would completely do away with the doctrine of purgatory, which, by the way, isn't in the Bible at all. Purgatory is supposed to be a place where, after death, our remaining sins are purged away. Supposedly, the friend and loved ones of the deceased person can pay to have masses or prayers said on their behalf to shorten the time in purgatory. This here is a blatant denial of the gospel of God's grace in Christ. You see, if his death places us in perfect standing with God, then purgatory is a complete lie. Does that make sense? His blood completely cleanses us from our sins. And we're made white as snow. Jesus' righteousness is now placed on us. And God sees us as righteousness, as, as righteous. In the doctrine of purgatory. Where again, you're waiting until certain all your sins are purged away. It's a lie. Our, our text here also eliminates the practice of penance. Now, this isn't to be confused with penitence, which is a synonym, synonym for repentance. Penance is a Catholic teaching that, a, that certain good deeds prescribed by the church will make satisfaction for sins and thus lessen the time in purgatory. Sometimes this is coupled with indulgences which supposedly remove the guilt or punishment of temporal sins. All of these unbiblical practices detract from the total merit of Christ's sacrificial death for us. His death, his death, our Savior's death on the cross, obtained total, complete forgiveness for believers. His death perfected us for all time. His death sanctified us once for all. His death completely takes away the guilt of our sins to believe in purgatory and to the practice of penance and indulgences it's like going back to the Jewish sacrificial system imagine a young man or 
with a young woman in love. But he and his lover are separated by distance. He has this beautiful photograph of her and gazes at it every single day. Finally, the two get to the two get married. The photo's still there, but now he has her. But then one day, he starts behaving strangely. He stands before his wife, clutching the photo to his chest, and he tells her, I really missed your photo, so I'm going back to it. He passionately kisses the picture and goes out the door mumbling, Oh, how I love you, dear photo. You are everything to me. I think all of us will rightly conclude, all of us will rightly be thinking that that guy needs some serious counseling. There's something wrong with him. That that guy's weird behavior illustrates what people do when they abandon Christ for the shadow. Christ and his sufficient sacrifice on the cross provide full forgiveness for all your sins. Any religious system that devises human works to atone for sins, it's a mere shadow. If you're at a church right now and you're being asked, regardless of the denomination, and you're being asked, you're being told that you do this and this, or you do that or that, or you go here or there, then it's you're one step closer to heaven to remind you. Be forgiven if you really have Jesus Christ, if he really is the Lord of your life, and if you really believe that he died on the cross for your sins, you've been forgiven completely. Completely and absolutely. And if you're still living in that system, it's never too late. Just get on your knees and ask him to forgive you of your sins. Believe in him to make him your personal Lord and Savior. Trust in Christ alone, and God bestows on you by grace alone his total forgiveness. And so if that's what you desire today, I'm going to invite you to the cross. So you can unpack, unload all your sins before Jesus. So he may forgive you. And give you your life. You want peace. You want forgiveness. You want redemption. You want mercy. I want to lead you in a prayer. Receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. So wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. With all your heart, with all sincerity, pray this. Pray this to Jesus. Lord, Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me. I believe that you died for my sins, for all of my sins, and three days later rose from the dead. Now I repent of my sins and that's you as my Lord, my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me.
So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that He will guide me, teach me, and make me born again by you. In your name, if you prayed that prayer, you want to walk with me in the family of God, you want to hear all about it. If you're here locally in El Paso, we want you to, we want to invite you here to Breckridge and Calvary Chapel, corner of Gateway South and Condo Pass. Here right now, Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, and we have Wednesday night men study. If you want more information about the church, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you for being with us. Thank you that you spent time out of your day to watch us pray that this message that I've been praying all week this message will uh, touch you that you are able to see again the, the beauty the wonder of his absolute sacrifice one sacrifice for all time nothing else hope you can join us next week, next week as we continue in this chapter until then, great week. Be safe. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.